As, oh, here we go. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. My name's Jesse Manisto. I am the editor of our uh, articles here at Genspect, submissions at genspect.org if you have any ideas you want to share after the fact. Um, I'm also, you may know me from Third Factor Magazine, which is something I run where we've talked about giftedness and gender, uh, among other things. So that's what brings me here today to talk to all of these fabulous ladies, because what, one of the things I want to say, I thought this after Killarney, and I'm thinking it again now, that this group is one of the best collections of both intellect and courage that I have ever had the privilege to be part of. And <laughs> that means all of you too, by the way. So give yourselves a hand. Sorry. But so <laughs> we, it's, it's uncommon, as I think you know, to, uh, to be the type of person who comes to something like this. And our panelists today have all demonstrated courage and intellect and that combination in their own work. And it's something that I think we all could really learn from. I was thinking of, you know, Joe Burgo talked yesterday about the importance of male role models for boys going through gender dysphoria. And of course, I also think that about the trans-identified girls who maybe haven't been encouraged to be courageous or to use their brains, to have been told that they should just stop being convenient, you know, they should sit down and don't be so inconvenient. So I hope that our panelists today can share some of their stories show off why they are exemplars for all of us, but they're not your mom. We're allowed to have boundaries. It's not our problem if people don't like what we have to say. So to start off, I wanna ask maybe Carol and Nina, because we haven't heard from them yet, if they can tell us some of their stories, what they have faced uh, and, and what they've done about it. Thank you. So I think it might be helpful to just describe how I got here and it's through the science. And uh, I started out before I came to Harvard for my PhD studying chimpanzees, wild chimpanzees in uh, Western Uganda. And that convinced me that sex is real, sex differences are real, and humans and non-human animals have a whole lot in common with what the kinds of sex differences I saw in chimpanzees. And so I started my PhD research on sex differences and testosterone, particularly in mental rotation and uh, other aspects of spatial ability and cognition, and just became, I was just extremely curious about how this all worked. That's why I wanted to get a PhD. I had no idea what I would do afterwards. Uh, but there was very little that would have convinced me that the sex differences that we see in humans and the reality of sex uh, is a social construction because I had this uh, experience, much like Heather did, sort of in the wild and observing sex from an evolutionary point of view. And my I, curiosity about it and my love of teaching led me to stay at Harvard as a non-tenured instructor, which was an unusual position for me to be in. I was in a human evolutionary biology department and I had this, um, I was basically responsible for the undergraduate program in that department for a long time. I developed close relationships with students and I taught about all, asp all aspects of uh, endocrinology. So hormones, what they do for us, what we do to them, sort of the reciprocal relationship between hormones and behavior and, and uh, culture and humans. And what I discovered is that students want the truth. Undergraduates can handle the truth. They um, are seeking it, they crave it, but as an instructor, you wanna have a sense in your classroom of trust. And that's important for engaging students in challenging each other and challenging me. But what I didn't expect, sorry, I'll probably start crying. What I didn't expect is that um, it was, happened to be graduate students, for the most part, who really didn't know me and weren't in my classroom. Uh, if it, kind of attacked me for, yes, I went on Fox and Friends and said, uh, talked about the reality of sex. But I also really had discovered, I'm now going back to the classroom for a second, had discovered that when I teach about the reality of sex and sexual development and the varieties and differences in sexual development, this always increases compassion, sorry, 
increases compassion among my students. They ended up wanting, the, those who were going to medical school, which is a lot of them, wanted to focus on trying to help people who had differences or disorders of sexual development. I developed close relationships with a lot of those students. Um, so I know that telling the truth is respecting people, is doing them a favor, and who am I to decide that my ideology is what other people need to hear, is what students need to hear as a science educator. That's manipulating that, their reality, and that is lying to them. So I came here because that is my f gut feeling, is that we, I should respect other uh, people, I should respect students by being honest, by telling them what I believe to be the truth as a science educator. I did that, yes, I did it on Fox and Friends. And I also said, but this is nature. There's nature over here, the facts of nature, and then there's what we want to do with it. There's what we think the implications are, and these are different things. And uh, it ended up leading to me um, feeling that I had no choice but to leave uh, my position at Harvard after all this time. I, this graduate student union took out a petition against me. I ended up not even being able to teach my big lecture class because none of them would serve as my teaching assistants. So since then, I have had a lot of discussions about sex and gender. And today, or, or last night, was a perfect example. I was talking to a scientist. I was talking to a mom, Emily, who is totally distraught over what is happening to her daughter and she doesn't know what to do about it. I was talking to Linda Blade, uh, a coach who's uh, extremely concerned about what is happening in sports. The truth is what all of these people have needed and are not getting. Our policies are not based on truth and evidence. So the more I discuss this and the more I discuss it openly, the better I feel about myself and living a life of integrity and the better I feel, the more free I feel to express myself and I know that I'm inspiring other people to do the same because that's what they're telling me. So if any... <laughs> it feels good to tell what you think is the truth, to have other people tell you it's helping them, and it is a sense of freedom, and it's your responsibility if you can do it. Not everyone can do it. I was able to leave my job. We took a financial hit, but it's worth it. I have new friends. I have friends um, who are more like you, who are the, some of the nicest people I have ever met um, since I ended up leaving my position, and uh, that's why I'm here. How about you, Nina? Yeah. I'm your friend, right? I know. <laughs> so my name is Nina Paley, and I'm a canceled artist. And I was just thinking the last, well, if it were 10 years ago, and I would be speaking into a microphone in front of a room of this many people, it would have been showing one of my two animated feature films, which almost nobody knows about now because I've been, well, some people know about them. Very few people know about them. Now I'm known as a turf. Uh, but back in the day, I was known for my abilities and accomplishments. Uh, and I made these, you know, really good feature films. Please go look at them for free. Sita Sings the Blues and Seder Masochism. And I've made other films, too. And I have opinions about copyright and many other issues. But now it's all turf all the time because I said in 2017 on Facebook that women don't have penises. <laughs> Now, why do I care so much about that? I care because it's true. And prior to about 2015, it seemed like I could engage with people and share all kinds of ideas and have discussions and have conversations and have different opinions and that it would not lead to a cancellation. And it just suddenly started happening, I guess in 2016 for me, uh, 2017, because I spent a year learning about TERFs, because I already knew about trans, because I had some trans lovers and a lot of trans friends, and I'm 55 years old, and I was hanging out with trans people before these people uh, had ever been born that were canceling me, telling me I need to make some trans friends and stop being a Trump supporter. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I spent about a year 
going like, well, they're calling me a turf. Like, what is a turf? And then realizing, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, radical feminism does make sense. These are the only people who are saying that sex is real. Uh, yeah, anyway, my life is different now. I do want to say that I think I suggested the title of this panel, Not Your Mom, uh, because I have noticed very much that women get so attacked more than men. There have been a few men, Graham Linehan being a clear example who's been viciously attacked, but for the most part I have seen men have more leeway to say things like women don't have penises. Like just for that alone they probably wouldn't have their careers ruined, that people could consider them reasonable, but there was like a real vicious attack on women. A lot of women have been canceled, a lot of women have been banned from Twitter and other social media. Uh, and there was just this expectation, you know, like I woke up one day and it's like, oh, I'm a middle-aged woman and these people think it's my job to validate them. And like they're mad at us, they're as mad at us as they would be as if their moms said no to them or something. <laughs> uh, it, there's the, like the depth of the rage is more than just a person said that they don't agree. It's like my job, like I am not fulfilling my my role as mom to the you know messed up young people of the world to affirm their identities. It's like I'm not going to do that. I want to tell the truth. Truth is important. If they can get you to believe absurdities, they can get you to commit atrocities. And I was actually saying that. <laughs> I was saying that prior to October 7th. You know, this stuff really worried me as a society, like as a member of society. So yeah, and also for personally, as somebody who had really severe depressive episodes when I was younger, I also knew that lying was a recipe for really poor mental health on my part. So I have suffered a lot, I've lost a lot, I've cried a lot. I still carry a lot of resentment for former friends who have denounced me and people who believed lies about me and spread them. And I have a certain, uh, I have more despair for humanity than I did before all this started, which is saying a lot. But I still do not regret my decisions to tell the truth. One day I'm, I'm gonna figure out how this mic works. Um, we as women are expected to be nice. And sometimes we just can't be nice. Uh, and I wonder if that's what goes through a lot of young women's heads when they're like, I don't want to be a woman. But, um, and you were talking about that, Carrie, in, in your discussion about not being nice to your patients. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about you know, when you uh, have had to push back a little bit in the medical field. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I touched on that with the, the opioid crisis, obviously, in the buildup to that, where it was, you know, this environment of, you know, making the patient happy. But when that conflicts with the Hippocratic Oath and, and um, you'd actually be making them worse, uh, it is really hard. And I think it took a while for me to, you know, find my voice. And that is part of, you know, maturing. Um, I mean, it, Heather was talking about, um, you know, men are more direct at addressing conflict. And one thing about my residency here at Denver Health, it was really, really male dominated. And emergency medicine still is male dominated. But, um, you know, it, it was it was great. It was hard, but it was just very direct. And I think I, I learned how to communicate in that style because that was the style of the residency and had a reputation of being quote unquote malignant. That was before uh, toxic masculinity w was thrown around. But yeah, you, you know, I, I think it's just as as the dysfunction in the bureaucracy of medicines developed. If you're um, practicing Hippocratic Oath Medicine, more and more you have to learn how to say no and not feel bad about it because you're actually really helping people. They just don't know it yet, but you know it's your duty and it is a really hard aspect of practicing medicine now, but you, you, just, you just have to do it. And, uh... Heather, you, you could name so many things, I think, through what you've been through from Evergreen, but I loved how in your presentation it was 
just so much intellectual data. Tell us a little bit more about your personal experiences, if you would. Sure. OK, I'm on. Um, I think actually talking about friendships. Um, my senior thesis in college was about how uh, monkeys, how uh, unrelated female monkeys find friends and what matters to them about friendships. And it may be surprising to hear that monkeys have friends, but they do. Uh, and uh, it's not all about the things we think of. It's not about kin, right? Um, and I was doing that work with a very important physical anthropologist um, whose work had been on skeletal differences, sexual skeletal differences in uh, early humans. And yet, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s, she got captured by this, whatever this is, this proto-ideology, even back then, such that when I walked in to the first day of my primatology class, there was a list of terms on the board that we were not allowed to use. And they included sexual selection and reciprocal altruism and other standard bearers of, of you know, truth in evolutionary biology. At the time, I couldn't imagine what actually was going on, but, and I was mostly silent then, I sat and I listened and I thought, this isn't the person I'm going to end up learning the most from. And I ended up learning more from the evolutionary biologist next door, Bob Trivers, whom I mentioned already. Um, but then I thought, OK, there's this one crazy anthropologist out there who doesn't believe in sexual selection, even though she literally studies the differences between skeletons um, by sex. How is that possible? And then through grad school, through the 90s, through the early aughts, it felt like that just disappeared. There were these rare things, rare people. And I think what happened is that most of the students who heard that stuff went, that doesn't make any sense. We're, gonna, like, we're not going to pay attention to those people. And most of them went out into the world and made sense for themselves. And some of them became professors and, um, and spoke what we understood to be truth. But some of the people who heard those faculty say those crazy things back in the 80s and 90s went on to become today's faculty. And that's what we are seeing. That is part of how the academy got taken over. Carol? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I've heard a lot of you mention truth. And any of you jump in where you're like, you don't have to wait for me to call on you. Um, Colin's presentation, he was saying, like, look, this is sex is binary and this is data, but it's getting into the journals that this other view, which I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like, this is Lysenkoism. And, <laughs> but if we say that, we get told, well, that's just your ideology. No one believes in truth anymore. And I think especially when we're talking about courage and speaking up, we have to have the courage of our convictions, but it's good to doubt yourself too to ask, could I be wrong? So I wonder if any of you on the panel would like to talk about where do you find the courage to say, no, I believe that this is true. I've done the work. Here's why. And what tips do you have? I'll, I'll take that first, because um, one of the things about teaching at Evergreen, which was an amazing school uh, and allowed for full-time full -time interactions with students such that you got to know them super well. And once you know just a little bit about everyone in the room with you, which is you know, an impossible in a room this big, but once you know something about everyone, when you say things that are, that are controversial, that seem dangerous, that people are going to disagree with, and someone takes offense, you can be sure, actually, they're not taking offense with you as a human being, but with the idea that you just presented. And you can also push back on them and say, yeah, I think you're wrong, or even I know you're wrong, and here's how I know. Or I think you're wrong, and here's why I think that. And sometimes, if you have a relationship with students, and I know Carol had the same kinds of experiences in her classrooms, it is incumbent upon the faculty to come back the next day, the next week, and say, I was wrong. I took a stand about something and I was wrong. And once you are able to do that in front of people, such you, you, you demonstrate humility and simultaneously respect for truth, then they don't think when you say things that sound outlandish to them that you're trying to bully them or that you're disrespecting them as people. You actually are trying to get to what is, what is true. And people, people want that, just as Carol was saying. And um, just to build on that, I've been, as I was thinking about what we were going to talk about, um, I must have realized this before, but I don't think there's any other system that works as well as truth and reality in people's efforts to reduce suffering. And, um, and we're seeing the consequences of ideology. And what, so it seems like there's truth versus ideology and 
I don't know what the other available systems are, but truth to me seems to be the best way towards true social progress and true social justice that has to be built on a foundation of reality. Otherwise, it will collapse. So that is why I think I have faith in the truth. There's nothing better um, than that. Yeah, and, and people need to be able to argue about the truth. There we go, yeah, they turned it on. People need to be able to talk, and the fact that so much of this is about suppressing speech and language, yeah, it's just, but it's like shutting people up. So many women have been banned from speaking. I mean, Corinna Cohn and I had a talk planned at the Denver Press Club for the Thursday before this conference at the Denver Press Club, which canceled us, because what we're talking about is so incredibly dangerous. So, I mean, it's not like anybody can know the whole truth, right, but we have to be able to talk about it. Okay. Yeah, just briefly. Hey. Um, you know, and, and, and some of it is a luxury belief. I mean, in the emergency department, it's just real, you know, medicine. Um, I mean, I'm not at an elite academic center by choice. I go down mostly to the south side of Chicago because I feel that's also my um, commitment to my city that I grew up in, that that's where people need to be, you know, served. But um, it's a luxury belief. There isn't any of this on the south side of Chicago. And, um, and uh, you know, also just in emergency medicine, you have to be hyper competent, right? I mean, and if as when you come in for a shift as the attending, if, if you're not competent, and obviously that means living in the truth, your staff you're just illegitimate, your staff doesn't follow you. So like there is no one in the emergency department that's incompetent to that level because they would just be weeded out. But the question is, when what's hard aside from all the dysfunctions is when these ideologies are seeping in. No one, no one asked any of us like, oh, we're gonna change this in the medical record, is that confusing to the end user? No, no one asked me that. No one asked you to just walk in one day and it's all this confusing stuff. It's those things that we're still fighting against that we then have to, you know, speak out in these forums about try and work through the hospital. But, you know, people are rooted in the truth. And then just very lastly, people I deal with that have like addiction issues, um, obviously we see all of that in the ER. You know, over the years I've found my voice and I am truthful. I, I tell people like, you're an alcoholic. And guess what? They know they are. And they appreciate when you, when you are a partner with them and say, I want to help you, but if you keep drinking, you're going to kill yourself. And I write that on the discharge. And I try and give them resources. Go to AA, do this. Or, you know, if you, if you don't lose weight, you know, your knees hurt because you're 350 pounds. You need to lose weight. And this, guess what? People who are overweight know it and they know that it's causing medical problems. I have so many people that say, thank you, Dr. Mendoza. No one has ever said that to me. All right, I'm being told it's time to wrap up, but uh, there's so much more that we could ask all of these women about their experiences, so I hope that you'll find them and ask them for their advice on how you also can go out there and do something and take a stand. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for being on the panel. Thank you.